Beyond the Canal es el título de la conferencia de hoy y eso tiene un propósito. Desde el Council of the Americas y seguramente muchos de quienes nos acompañan hoy comparten esta visión. Creemos que el potencial logístico de Panamá va más allá del canal. Sin duda que la ampliación del canal es un pilar fundamental para el futuro del desarrollo económico del país, pero alcanzar un desarrollo logístico integrado que vaya beyond the canal requerirá de iniciativas e inversiones que serán materia de discusión aquí hoy. La ampliación del canal concluyó en un momento en que el desaceleramiento económico global le ha dado tracción a ideas proteccionistas en Europa y Estados Unidos. Hay crecientes cuestionamientos sobre las virtudes del libre comercio. Y para usar una metáfora que viene muy bien al tema, sobre los efectos de globalización que según muchas voces no ha elevado la marea al mismo nivel para todo el mundo. Con este telón de fondo han surgido interrogantes sobre el retorno de los fondos invertidos en la expansión del canal. Son interrogantes legítimos que a nuestro modo de ver se deben responder persistiendo en la visión de convertir a Panamá en un hub global que no sea apenas un sitio de paso para buena parte del comercio mundial, sino en un sofisticado centro de logística en las Américas al nivel de Singapur y Holanda, países que han sabido maximizar su privilegiada ubicación geográfica tanto en Asia como en Europa. País es una de las Perdón, Panamá es una de las economías que más crece en América Latina y el mundo. De acuerdo con el Banco Mundial, el país creció 5.8% en el 2015 y la proyección para este año es superior al 5%. Dentro de ese escenario, de por sí muy positivo, el sector de transporte y logística ha contribuido de manera significativa. En los últimos cinco años, el sector creció a un promedio de 8.9% anual y en el 2015 representó nada menos que el 18% del Producto Interno Bruto. No es casual que Panamá se mantenga como un destino predilecto en la región para los inversionistas extranjeros. Y ayer nos decían que eh, la inversión extranjera es un 11% del FDI, con lo cual tiene que seguir llegando. Muchos de ellos nos contarán por qué Panamá es una valiosa oportunidad en sectores tan diversos como el energético, el financiero y el tecnológico, y por supuesto el sector logístico. Esta conversación sobre Panamá como centro logístico en las Américas no sucede en el vacío, y el objetivo de la conferencia de hoy es entender mejor cómo esa industria puede ser un motor de desarrollo socioeconómico que beneficie a todos los sectores de la población. En ese contexto general de Panamá como un hub de logística, una pieza clave es la ciudad de Panamá. Hace poco tuvimos el honor de recibir al alcalde Blandón en Nueva York y escuchar que la ciudad ha sido declarada por la prestigiosa Fundación Rockefeller como una de las tres Resilient Cities de Centroamérica y el Caribe. Esta distinción es un estímulo, pero también un compromiso para que la ciudad de Panamá continúe enfrentando retos como las deficiencias en el manejo del agua, la falta de infraestructura y la debilidad en las estrategias de mitigación del cambio climático que ya ha empezado a impactar a la región metropolitana. Otro factor determinante en el futuro de Panamá como un centro logístico de primer nivel es resolver los desafíos de movilidad urbana. Vemos con muy buenos ojos las inversiones que el país ha venido haciendo en el metro de la ciudad y yo lo he montado. Y su compromiso, conseguir expandiendo la red. Un país no puede ser realmente productivo si la fuerza laboral tiene que sacrificar horas de sueño y vida familiar sorteando los problemas de tráfico. Hoy tenemos el privilegio de tener aquí a un representante de iSingapore que nos compartirá ejemplos de planeamiento urbano en ciudades emergentes en Asia 
que enfrentan retos similares a los que afronta la ciudad de Panamá y su área metropolitana. Este balance no sería completo si no mencionáramos otro reto que es crucial resolver para construir un sector logístico viable. Estamos hablando de la creación de una fuerza laboral entrenada que pueda ocupar las posiciones que están disponibles. Cerrar la brecha entre lo que ofrece la mano de obra y lo que demanda el mercado es ahora más urgente que nunca para consolidar la visión de país que se ha propuesto Panamá. Cada año, el Council of the Americas viaja a unas ocho ciudades en Latinoamérica en un circuito denominado Latin American Cities Conferences. Y en cada ciudad a la que llegamos nos preguntan cómo analizamos el contexto internacional. Un tema que concentra la atención y que genera sin duda un grado de incertidumbre son las elecciones presidenciales de noviembre en los Estados Unidos. A principios de mes se cumplió un hito histórico en Estados Unidos cuando por primera vez una mujer se consolidó como la nominada de uno de los dos principales partidos. Pero hay muchos interrogantes alrededor de lo que una candidatura y potencialmente una presidencia de Donald Trump puede significar, no solo en el frente doméstico, sino en las relaciones de Estados Unidos con el resto del mundo y en nuestro caso con Latinoamérica. Es un tema que seguiremos mirando con mucha atención porque podrá tener repercusiones a nivel diplomático, comercial, regulatorio e inclusive de seguridad. Hoy tenemos la suerte de contar con los embajadores que conducen la relación bilateral entre Estados Unidos y Panamá, quienes nos pondrán al día sobre los diferentes ámbitos de cooperación entre ambos países. Por supuesto, lo que todo el mundo se está preguntando es no solo las consecuencias en la Unión Europea del Brexit, sino los efectos que pueda tener en nuestra región a nivel económico, pero también político. Y aunque estamos aquí para hablar de Panamá, es importante mencionar lo que sucede en el resto de la región. En primer lugar, Venezuela que preocupa no solo por la crisis de la deuda y por la dificultad con que muchas empresas operan en ese país, sino por la gravedad de la situación humanitaria y la posibilidad de que desborde sus fronteras. Brasil preocupa también porque el punto de llegada de la crisis actual no está claro y si bien el equipo económico actual es muy sólido, es necesario que cuente con el consenso político para implementar reformas y retomar la senda del crecimiento. Pero no todos son nubes negras. La transición en Argentina ha despertado no solo interés, sino entusiasmo en que la tercera economía latinoamericana retome el lugar económico que le corresponde y ejerza un liderazgo político del cual se beneficie el resto de la región. También el cese del conflicto en Colombia y la apertura comercial entre Cuba y Estados Unidos son señales de que la región busca cada vez más adaptarse al contexto mundial, dejando atrás décadas de confrontamiento ideológico e inclusive militar. Entonces, quiero invitarlos a participar activamente en algunos paneles. Dejaremos algunos momentos para hacer preguntas y sé que son Ustedes son, están interesados en discutir, eh, así que los invito a participar. Y una vez más, estoy muy, muy contenta de estar de nuevo en Panamá. Muchas gracias. Thank you for coming and enjoy the conference. Muchas gracias, Randy. E invito a pasar al escenario al embajador John D. Feely, embajador de Estados Unidos en Panamá, al embajador Emanuel González Revilla, embajador de Panamá en los Estados Unidos, y en este panel Eric Farnsworth, vicepresidente de la American Society y Council of the Americas, será el entrevistador. El nombre del panel es El papel de Panamá como una nación conectora. Le comunico a la audiencia que la conversación será en inglés, con traducción simultánea en español. Muchas gracias. Well, Randy, thank you very much. Thank you very much, and for the opportunity to uh, join all of you this morning for what promises to be a fascinating conversation. I'm particularly pleased to have the opportunity to 
uh, moderate this panel for two reasons. As John knows, because I've known John literally for this amount of time, I began my career in 1990 at the U.S. Department of State working on Panama issues. And so, although I've been back several times since then, uh, it is a country that I love to return to each time. Sometimes things change, sometimes things don't change. The things that change are the skyline, which seems to change by the day. But what doesn't change is the hospitality of the Panamanian people, which has always been warm and welcoming, and it's a real delight to be back uh, here in this particular country at this particular time. At the, the second reason why I'm delighted to be here is because I have the opportunity to have a conversation with two very close friends who happen to be ambassadors to our respective countries. Uh, and it is a real pleasure to welcome to this conference Emmanuel Gonzalez Rivilla, who is the ambassador of Panama in Washington, and John Feely, of course, who is the ambassador of, Washington, uh, of the United States here in Panama. All of you know the news uh, that has been uh, happening very recently with reference to Panama. Uh, of course, just over a year ago was the most recent Summit of the Americas, which was a historic occasion, uh, and that really continued Panama's place on the map. And then, of course, just this weekend, uh, we had the celebration of the expansion of the Panama Canal uh, over 100 years uh, since when the canal first opened in 1914. And that's really where I want to begin the conversation with both ambassadors. You know, Panama has for years been a country that we might say in English has punched above its weight, right? It's a country that has achieved so much more than other countries perhaps of similar size uh, and, uh, and weight. And yet, you continue to lead the way on that. What's your secret sauce? Let's start with uh, Ambassador Gonzalez Rivilla to simply begin the conversation with Panama as a, as a crossroads for the world. Help us understand what is your strategic vision and, and how are you accomplishing that with such success? This one. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. First of all, thanks. To, uh, to Council of Americas for, for setting up uh, this event today and for, for the invitation. Um, you know, it's, I think, you know, we've been, we've been in, you know, a crossroads of the, of, of the world and, and, uh, and, and trade for, you know, over 500 years, Panama. So, so this, is, this is a role that, that we have been playing since, since we were Panama, as, you know, a country. So, so uh, you know, this is, this is where the conquistadores came and, and, uh, and, and crossed the Eastmouth by, by different means before the, the canal was even built. So, so we've been playing that role. And, 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 and you, know, a, a, you know, a different, uh, a different uh, uh, stages throughout, throughout our history. Um, of course, you know, once, once the canal was built uh, and, and Panama, you know, got it uh, separated from Colombia and became a, a republic, then you know our role as a, as a, as a you know the Dominican Republic changed a little bit. Then you know we became we became uh, uh, the, the waterway became a center of, of, of all trade routes. You know commerce trade changed uh, routes commerce, commerce uh, routes changed uh, and uh, and uh, and then and then Panama started sort of evolving over time. You know, and then this this sprawling economy uh, 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 evolved as well. The free zone, which is the second largest free zone in the world after after Hong Kong, you know, bustling a, a financial center. Uh, then with the turnover of the canal, uh, uh, even though there were a lot of skeptics as to if Panama was going to be able to operate the the canal uh, efficiently, you know, uh, you know. Uh, we did it uh, even better than, than people even hoped that we would be able to. Uh, and, and with a combination of, of, of last, last uh, Sunday's event, which basically uh, now with an expanded canal. Uh, I think uh, we've, we've sort of silenced those criticisms and those critics that, that uh, there have been many, uh, unfortunately, but, uh, but I think uh, uh, I think that, uh, that uh, this, is, this is something that, that uh, you know, we Panamanians argue about a lot, a lot of things all the time, but the canal is something that unites them, unites us all, uh, and 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 this is something that we we believe truly that it's the essence of of, of, of our future. And I think uh, you know the the the, the locks, as 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 uh, Jorge Quijano administrator said, you know, this is something that was planned for over 20 years, 
and you know and if you look at things you know long term the effects it has and and how it, and the implication it has in the economy then we can we can really uh, make it happen and once once you look at this uh, uh, you know and, and again you know we've been and 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 we we are the center of not only trade you know we have a tremendous air hub we have an incredible telecom hub as well seven different uh, submarine cables go through here which is something we haven't really explored it uh, uh, to, to, to its maximum we we become sort of a diplomatic bridge as well as you could see you know with the results of the of the summit of the Americas last year you know with the you know uh, with the with the with the with the, with the, the handshake between President Obama and and uh, and President Castro, so you know all, you, we continue to play that role of of mediators of bringing people together, and uh, and now we have a you know a big responsibility with expanded canal, and and the new opportunities th that's going to create not only for us, but also for the world. So we're going to go to John in just a minute, but I want to follow up on something that you said, which is very key. Uh, you know the canal expansion project has been ongoing for years, right? Twenty years at least. Yes. So you obviously have to have a longer term vision for how you position Panama in the global economy. You gave us a really good sense about what's led up to this point. Give us a sense of going forward, what's the vision for how do you continue to build Panama's position as a bridge nation in the global economy, taking advantage of the assets you've just identified? I think you know, it's, it's, uh, it's imperative to, to leverage our strategic position, our asset, biggest asset, which is the canal, uh, our, our logistics uh, platform, um, and which which is not only the canal, as I said earlier, it's also our ports facilities, which are the most efficient in Latin America, uh, our 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 airport facilities, which are being expanded. I think there's tremendous opportunities in terms of creating a, an air cargo hub as well, and and bringing all those together. I, also, I think there's huge opportunities in terms of of the technology side bringing in all those technologies uh, uh, companies uh, to set up shop in Panama. So I think you know, we need to work together on a long-term plan for that, not just for the short term. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for uh, joining Thank our you. conversation so uh, effectively right at the beginning. Uh, John, let's turn to you. Uh, from the U.S. perspective, Panama has been a real partner of the United States for a long time. Uh, your presence here as one of, in my personal view, one of the very best in the U.S. diplomatic service shows that the United States continues to value that relationship and wants to build it. Give us a sense, from your perspective, some of the priorities and the cooperative areas that we're working together, we, the United States, are working together with Panama on and where that relationship might be heading. Absolutely, Eric, and, and thank you very much, and thanks to the Council, and thanks to everybody for joining us this morning for a great and timely conversation. Um, you asked just a second ago, uh, what's the secret sauce here in Panama? And uh, I've only been here for four or five months, um, but every Sunday I go down and walk on the Cinta Costera in the afternoon, watch the sunset, watch the community come out, and there's a little kiosk down there called Cecilia Pescao, and whatever the sauce is, it's on her ceviche, so I, I highly recommend a trip down to the Cinta Costera. No, I say that not really as a joke, because I do go down there, but um, I, I think the secret sauce here is in the people the Panamanian people. If you take a look at the way in which Panamanians have adapted, and when I say adapted, I mean their resilience and their ability to deal with shifting geostrategic and geopolitical realities. So we all know the history of the canal, and you all know that when you know the canal was turned back over, as Emmanuel said, you know, great concern, great worries uh, that the canal was going to fall apart, that the Panamanians couldn't manage it, that uh, the Chinese were going to take it over, and we were going to have you know warships from Beijing uh, threatening the United States national security. Every time there has been a question as to whether or not the canal and Panama can overcome the challenges. Panama and the canal and the Panamanian people have proven the critics wrong. So you ask me what are our priorities going forward. Our priorities are pretty simple, Eric. The United States sees Panama as a partner. Uh, the United States, as I've told many people before, the United States is not the proconsul, the United States is not the power behind the throne. 
The United States obviously is asymmetrically much larger than Panama in terms of its economy, in terms of uh, the, the population, et cetera, our purchasing power. But the United States sees in Panama almost the perfect crystallization of that democratic partner committed to open markets. You take a look at the way in which, again, Panama since 1989 has sustained and nurtured its democracy. Um, you see the way in which it has built itself. You mentioned it as you came in. Take a look at the way the city has been built up. Um, it's not without its problems, and, and everybody, any Panamanian here knows them. The traffic is one of them. Um, but every time there seems to be a problem, you find that the Panamanian people, independent of party, step up and begin to look at solutions. So take a look at infrastructure here in the country. And I'm not talking about the canal. I'm talking about the metro. The only city in Latin America to have a metro, working on a third line, working with the Japanese to finance that third line. Uh, the first line's already been a tremendous hit. Um, and so I think that what the United States wants to do is position itself out of enlightened self-interest, quite frankly, to take advantage of all of these hub facilities. And the last thing I would say is that I think when we, get, when we ask ourselves, and my team and I and the Department of State and, and the entire U.S. government, I mean, just this last weekend I had down 20 congressmen to include the chairman of the House Transportation Infrastructure Committee, um, Bill Schuster. I mean, these are people who manage literally billions and billions of dollars of budget that go to the United States to work with our... Take a look at what we're doing in the United States to prepare for what will come. You have to agree that the Panama Canal expanded now by Panama, 100% by Panama, I believe is really going to become, like in technology, we talk about disruptor technologies, the expanded canal is going to be a disruptor piece of infrastructure, which means that we don't really know everything that's going to happen, but we have to be prepared. And that's what I think Panama is doing right now. And the United States, our priority, writ large, I mean, I can go into a whole bunch of little you know, subdivisions, but our priority is to be prepared to support the democratic government of Panama, the people of Panama, and U.S. business, again, in our own enlightened self-interest. John, thanks very much. I want to follow up uh, on a couple points that you just uh, brought into the conversation. Uh, the first is the United States is a true partner of Panama. This, in some ways, is a paradigm shift, but one that is probably long overdue and I think welcomed by people of both countries. Um, and the question I would ask going forward then is, as a partner and Panama, strong democracy, open market oriented, uh, bridge to, to global commerce, etc. Are there things that the United States can do to help Panama along that path? Uh, I'm thinking specifically in the context of the trade agenda. There might be many others. But uh, Panama has expressed interest in uh, things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, like APEC, et cetera, et cetera. And without reference to the current moment in the United States or Brexit or all of those macro issues which are absolutely relevant here, but just in the context of the bilateral relationship, are there things that the United States could be doing to help promote this vision of, uh, that, that uh, the ambassador has mentioned in terms of uh, uh, further positioning Panama going forward? Absolutely. Um, the, and, and the most important thing is going on already, and that is the preparation of American, primarily East Coast and Gulf Coast ports, to be able to take advantage of the new locks in Cogoli and Aguas Claras, where the Neo Panamax ships will go through. Um, I think one of the most exciting developments, and one that frankly nobody saw seven, eight years ago when the uh, referendum passed and they began the construction, is has to do with not the first boat that went through, but the second ship that went through. And that was a Japanese Neopanamax liquid propane gas tanker taking liquid propane gas from Sabine Pass in the Gulf Coast out to Japan. 
This is a, an incredibly new and exciting opportunity. The growing economies of Asia, uh, even with deceleration in China, but you've got you know a new trade promotion agreement with Vietnam and the United States. That economy is growing. You've got Malaysia. You've got India. And uh, I'm sorry, uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. You've got all of these places that are now going to be able to access cheaper and more reliable energy sourced from the United States that is, again, something that is relatively new within the last two or three years at the most, and it's going to be able to provide more reliable and cheaper energy, uh, cleaner energy, and that, I think, is going to generate a whole holistic, holistic cycle. That's one issue. The second issue is probably one that you don't think of, but it has to do with being a genuine partner in terms of looking at security threats. Um, Panama is a crossroads for a lot of good things, but let's be very frank, Panama is also a crossroads for a lot of bad things. And what I'm thinking of primarily is the Ill illegal drug trade and the undocumented migration through this country, both of which are nothing more than a function of, you know, what Benito Juarez once called the la maldición de geografía. Uh, you're stuck in the middle between the source zone of cocaine in the Andes and sadly, tragically, the consuming nation of cocaine in my country. So the United States has, as Hillary Clinton and President Obama uh, have said and John Kerry has said, we have a responsibility, we have a co-responsibility to deal with security threats here. And in that regard, we have an extremely robust um, cooperative relationship with all of the agencies here in Panama, what they call here the Estamentos de Seguridad. And I think we're going to continue that, and that's something we have, as I said, both a moral obligation, but also a self, uh, you know, an enlightened self-interest uh, requirement to do. And as we've seen migration begin to uh, affect this country in Costa Rica and the movement of what they call extracontinentals, uh, people who are tragically fleeing places where they don't see a future. And so that future is so bleak that they do see that they're willing to risk their lives going through triple canopy jungle in the Darien with Colombian guerrillas and Bakrim, uh, organized crime. Again, we have a lot of technology in the United States. We have a lot of methodologies and protocols for linking up border services, and we're doing just that. John, thank you very much. Uh, very well said. You brought security into the uh, conversation, which I was going to do, but you did that already. Thank you for doing that. Uh, and I think that's a good way to, uh, to return to, uh, to Emmanuel. Um, let me ask you a, somewhat of a counterintuitive question, if I may. Um, he's good on his feet, so he'll be fine with us. Uh, obviously, the canal is the primary infrastructure asset of the country. We've talked about it. We've celebrated it. Uh, we've seen the expansion just recently. Um, the title of our conference is Beyond the Canal. And I'm wondering, you know, we've seen what's happened in South America with an over-reliance on commodities, uh, with the Chinese market and some of the Asian markets slowing. And the question I would ask is going forward, obviously the, the canal is a massive asset. Are there things that can be done indeed, however, to diversify Panama even beyond the canal or take advantage of the canal to help build a broader economy for the people of Panama? And if so, what might that look like? How would you help us think that through? Well, I, I think if you, if, if you look at our economy today, I think not one single uh, a, a sector of the economy accounts for over 17 percent of the of the economy still, and over 80 percent of the economy is service based. So as it is today, our economy is actually quite well diversified. I think I think what we need to what we need to uh, 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 figure out is a way where we can actually add more value added services in 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 in, in, in our matrix. Um, you know we are. And, and again, you know, you mentioned earlier that I, I think, I mean, sorry, John mentioned earlier that when we, when we looked at the canal uh, uh, expansion and we did the, the referendum to, to actually approve the expansion, and when they originally looked at the, at, at the, uh, at the, at the locks, at the new locks, you know, the, the shale uh, boom in the U.S. was not even there, or, or even the, 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 the cap capability of the U.S. to export LNG. You know, now that is going to be uh, a possibility. 
you know, fast forward, now we are building, you know, U.S. company actually is building a huge LNG plant and also port facility, which again will most likely be used as an as a LNG, LNG hub. So that's another, another bridge going back to your earlier question of, of what's, you know, the, the, the possibilities that are going to be able to, to, to flourish and new businesses that weren't even considered, you know, even, you know, four or five years ago. Uh, and, and that goes to John's point about the the evolving or the ability of the Panamanian people to evolve to meet exactly. conditions as they so so I think I think I think our biggest challenge is is really not how we diversify our 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 economic base but rather how we educate our people to actually be able to keep current as the technology and the new and 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 these new opportunities to race. And, uh, right. and that is something the Council of Americas is focused on, not just for Panama, but throughout the region. Absolutely yes. critical. Help us think through what's the government of Panama doing to ensure that that's the case? Are there uh, plans? Are there uh, programs in place now? Yes, we, we do. I mean, se se several, there's this se several, uh, uh, you know, first, again, I think, you know, given our strategic location, you know, location, 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 I think that has a lot to do with, 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 uh, with, with, who, the identity of our country, I think, uh, uh, and, and, and again, and, and that's why we have the canal and, and, and the success of our country. Uh, but, you know, languages is, is something that is, that is critical. Uh, President Varela launched one of his uh, uh, first programs was a, a program called Panama Bilingue, where we want, you know, this government wants to train uh, uh, 10,000 teachers, uh, 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 English teachers. So. So far, we sent about 2,000 teachers already to the U.S. and the U.K. and Canada. And the idea is that eventually we would have uh, bilingual education at public schools, and all public schools in Panama. And that would also, you know, open doors and, and access. Also, you know, there's, there's been a, um, um, just recently we, we awarded the construction of, uh, of the first uh, technical institute based on the Singapore uh, model, which is also going to be a bilingual institute, by the way. And, and that's also geared towards specific qualifications, technology, and specific needs that, we, that the private sector would need and, and sort of increase the, 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 uh, the, the capacity of the of, 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 of workforce. Uh, and that's one of three that's being built. So, so I think, uh, and again, you know, I think you need to be in constant sort of uh, 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 communication and, and in touch with the, with, the, with, the, with the private sector who are actually driving driving the, all, all, all this growth and we need to be, make, make sure as a government to, that we can provide the, the sort of the, the, the regulatory framework for this, you know, and, and support for, for, for these things to happen. Yeah. No, thank you very much. We're going to have the chance to go to those of you who might have questions here in just a minute, so be preparing those. So let me follow up, um, uh, Ambassador, with what you just said, you know, uh, in terms of the business community. The business community, in terms of investment decisions and engagement, one of the things that they look for, that we look for, is confidence, right? And rule of law and the ability to have a, um, uh, to see into the future to the extent possible. Um, when President Varela came to Washington to keynote the Washington conference that we hosted at the State Department, uh, the Council of the Americas hosted, uh, which you helped set up and John, you helped set up, uh, so thank you again for that. Uh, he was a hit. He was terrific. Uh, but one of his main messages to us in early May was Panama's uh, very aggressive attack on corruption. Uh, this is clearly relevant from the business community perspective, and I wonder what you can tell us, Mr. Ambassador, in terms of updating us on that front as a, as a real priority for Panama uh, going forward. And then, John, give you a quick comment uh, on that issue, and then go to the audience for your questions and, and comments. No, I think you know. I think I think from 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 the beginning of of, of President Barrera's administration, he was clear that the one of his main, if not, and as he said in the in in uh, in, uh, in in D.C. that his main legacy, he wants it to be, you know, strong institutions, you know, strong democratic institutions, not just infrastructure works. And by that he meant, you know, I want that he wanted to have, you know, transparent government institutions, you know, uh, independent uh, uh, institutions as well. Um, you know, I think, I think that, you know, a lot of uh, uh, the amount of, um, a, uh, cases that are being that are being uh, investigated and so forth uh, right now is unprecedented. 
I think those those uh, eh, eh, you know the 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 justice. Uh, the attorney general's office and the fiscales are doing their job and 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 that's independent and they need to continue doing those investigations and and then the courts will need to decide what happens but i think you know i think uh, 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 our role now is for that those uh, uh those cases have been brought to justice and then now justice need to need, need, needs to run its course I, I think now the government what they need to do is make sure that the structures are there for these things not to happen again and uh, and again, you know, I think I think th you know there needs to be there needs to be uh, people need to be held responsible if there's any misconduct, and I think uh, and there need to be consequences. And I think if people know that, then and it actually happens, and people are held responsible for that, then 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 the, the whole system uh, becomes more transparent. And again, you know, I think if you look at everything that that this administration has done in terms of improving transparency, it's remar remarkable. Um, again, you know, in, in you know all, all the laws that have been passed in terms of, of go transparency, government transparency, money laundering, uh, um, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we got out of the of, of the, of the uh, FATF gray list, you know, in record time. Um, you know, I, I think there hasn't been a more committed government uh, in terms of transparency than this one. So, and and, and I think you've seen that. In 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 the in the uh, uh, in the government bids, there's there's a lot more uh, companies interested in bids than than in the past you know five years. So in the previous five years, so I think I think that shows because again you know it's very expensive to actually prepare bids, and and if you think the process is rigged, you know why why even show up, uh, spend the money. So I th I think uh, uh, and and I think you see also a lot more U.S. companies coming in. Uh, which, which is actually what we're trying to do. You know, that's that's one of our one of our roles in, at, at the embassy. It's just you know knocking doors and, and bringing U.S. companies here. And I hope and I hope to help you, John. Like you said a couple of days ago, that you want the U.S. to be the the number one foreign direct investor in you know U.S. companies. I didn't know the U.S. government. Some people didn't get that right. No, no, <laughs> so no. I, I, let me let me make it very clear. I want the United States to be the number one foreign direct investor in Panama, and I may I don't hide that. I mean, <laughs> you know, a lot of times uh, we have to be very careful. We have to tread very lightly, uh, especially in this region, given our history. Um, but uh, I think. I think a couple of things on corruption and on investment, Eric. Number one, you know, uh, and all of your, your sponsors and your members know that money is a coward. Money is a coward. It doesn't want to go where there's a risk. Well, I think if you take a look at who's already here, who has already made their bet with Panama? Over 200 companies, American companies, 75 have regional headquarters here. Uh, we just celebrated a few of them a couple of days ago. I know some of you were with us, and I thank you for coming along. Uh, we celebrated uh, the, uh, the history of Caterpillar here, uh, the history of MIT uh, Terminal, the Manzanillo Terminal in Colon, and a small company, uh, Open uh, Blue Fish Company, uh, that is doing just some amazing international exporting work out of... Oh, let me make sure. Um, but I think in terms of dealing with the issue of corruption, um, hemispherically, there is clearly a movement in the street, whether that is the Argentine street, the Chilean street, the Guatemalan street, the Mexican street. There is a movement, and I believe it is fueled by the proliferation of social media and citizens actually becoming more empowered. There's a movement that rejecting a lot of the cozy historical arrangements between the elected and the economic elites. And there is a feeling that the people, the rising middle class of Latin America, have been somehow ripped off. And quite frankly, I would say they're right. And so as a result, I think we're going to have to deal with the fact, and I believe it's a very healthy fact, over the coming years, that elected leaders are simply going to have to be more accountable, more transparent, and more honest with populations as to what is happening with that foreign direct investment dollar or that tax dollar that has been collected. Where are the services? Where is the proof in the pudding? 
And one of the things I think, and this is to bring it back to the previous conversation on education, one of the things I think that the, the Varela government has done exceptionally well and where we have partnered with them is to focus on education because fighting corruption has a number of facets, but just like fighting drug trafficking, there's a preventative and there's a repressive activity that have to be combined holistically if you're gonna be successful. And it's in the preventative method and the preventative efforts of eradicating the culture of corruption that I think Panama has been very forward leaning, but undeniably has a ways to go. You know, I believe firmly that the difference between on the Transparency International Index that comes out every year, the difference between Denmark and say Somalia is not race, it's not ethnicity, it's the strength of the institutions, as Emmanuel just said, strong democratic institutions filled by career professionals, led by committed public servants elected by the people who understand that it's really not cool anymore to use the term huega vivo, who understand that, you know, while you all wink and you nod and people have pocketed and done well and han forrado los nidos, that's not really acceptable anymore. Corruption's always gonna be with us. It's the nature of man. But corruption can be checked, it can be reduced, but it has to start with education. And so that's why one of the things that we are very excited to partner with uh, this government on are the early childhood education efforts and getting out to traditionally marginalized populations. You know, you look at Panama Bilingue, just a marvelous effort. Pero vamos a ser sincero, nadie aquí esta mañana necesita Panama Bilingüe, todos ustedes son bilingües. But if you go out to the Comarcas, if you go out to Colón, well, Colón, you actually find a lot of English speakers, but it's <laughs> not necessarily English I would understand. Uh, but if you go out into the, you know, let's say El Chorrillo or San Miguelito, you don't have to go that far, what you find here in Panama is that there is undeniably a bilingual gap that goes right along with a class gap. And so it's pushing that education out to previously less focused upon sectors of the population. And our assessment from Washington is that this government is absolutely committed to doing it and recognizes that they will not grow the labor force of the future that Panama needs in a knowledge-based economy if they are not reaching them and teaching them about fair play, level playing field, English, along with all of the STEM studies, and hopefully there'll be some time for art history. <laughs> which, which goes to the point, though, when we talk about infrastructure, a lot of people assume that we're meaning physical infrastructure, and that generally is what a lot of people mean, but we've also talked about the infrastructure of institutions, and now we've just been talking about human capital as well, which is fundamental to all of this and making it work as a critical aspect of growth, development, infrastructure, and bringing in the traditionally marginalized uh, from societies around the hemisphere. It's fantastic points that both of you have been making. I'd love to continue along this line. We don't have a whole lot of time uh, left, but we do. I did promise the opportunity to bring some of you into the conversation. Let's take two questions. There's one way in the back. I believe we have a circulating microphone, so if you could wait for that. Uh, and if the question is for either ambassador in particular, please uh, be sure to identify for who it's going to yeah. and identify yourself. Thank you very much for the Mr. Ambassador John. Um, one of the initiative uh, that I would like to appoint you, I don't know if you have in your agenda, but um, in the news it's been said that Panama is pursuing company like Amazon, eBay to start an operation in Panama and use all the facility that we have. And Dell has been a success story in Panama. I don't know if you have in your agenda to approach those kind of company and to be like, you know, the link with our country to have them to establish here in Panama. Thank you very much. John, let's wait for the second sure. question and get sure. to, to you, if there is a second question. Um, maybe that's the only one. Last opportunity. All right, we'll deal with that one. John, Mr. Ambassador, please. Sure. Um, the, I, I think a lot of companies, or actually I know a lot of companies, uh, are talking about opportunities in Panama. 
What we do in the embassy is that we work with the government to ensure that, and I've used this term before and I know I've had to explain it a few times, but to ensure that the playing field is as level as possible for American companies to invest. And that's what every embassy does. The Canadians do the same thing, the Brits do the same thing. One of the great advantages that we have is that we start with a trade promotion agreement. And that automatically is like getting, you know, sort of the playbook handed to the companies who are going to do the deal between and among themselves and the governments. So people already know what a lot of the rules of the road are. That may, that's one of the reasons why we've had so many companies who have set up regional centers here, who see Panama because of a great airport, because of Copa Airlines that can take them to a bazillion different destinations with short layovers, et cetera. It's one of the reasons why Panama is very attractive. Um, I won't get involved directly, or the embassy won't, in the business to B2B negotiations. But I, there is not a single American business person d uh, without regard to size, whatever the, you know, the capital investment they may have in mind, that I won't see when they come through. I've, already, I've only been here four or five months. I've probably seen 15 to 20 current, many of them are current investors here and people doing business here, and then a lot of prospective ones. Airbnb is looking to come down here. Um, I think that's a marvelous opportunity. Amazon, I mean, you know, my embassy lives off of Amazon Prime. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't come home from my, and we have, we're very fortunate because we have a, an American uh, DPO mailbox, um, but I don't come home, uh, you know, more than once a week without a box for my wife. And it's all hidden in the Amazon Prime, so I got no idea what it is, but I think a lot of them are shoes. I'm not really sure. It's a great, it's a great place for something like Amazon uh, to be able to work. And my goal, as I said, very boldly, very openly, is to be number one. I want Americans down here because we work well with Panamanians. And more importantly, Panamanians work well with us. John, thanks very much. And as we close the conversation, I want to give uh, Ambassador Gonzalez Rivia the opportunity to make a final comment uh, and perhaps uh, key off this question. You know, as you go back to Washington, as you think about your mission in Washington, we've heard a lot about the U.S. Uh, mission in, in Panama, uh, the Panamanian uh, mission in Washington. What, what do you wish more broadly that the American people would know about Panama as we're talking about business links and cultural links and education and all this? What would be something that if you had a magic wand, if you could uh, change something, that you would uh, bring to the American people and to say, this is Panama, this is what you need to know? I think this is the first time I've ever seen him speechless, actually. The no, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Um, no, I think, you know, Panama, you know, it's, it's open for business. That's, that's what it, I think, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's um, we have a thriving economy. I think, you know, it's the fastest growing economy in the, in the Western Hemisphere. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, we've been in the, in, in the news, you know, lately for, for, for a good reason. Previously, not for so good reason. So I think, uh, 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 you know, we're, we're more than, we're, that, 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 that we are open for business. And, 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 and I think that, uh, that uh, if, if I were to bring something would be, you know, please get your ports ready. <laughs> Because you know, I I, th I think it's 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 interesting. You know, we again, you know, we, we, we tend to sort of criticize. We we are extreme critics of ourselves here in Panama, and and uh, you know, and and yes, the canal was a little bit late, but guess what? There's only I think what John four ports in the U.S. that are ready to take Neo Panama ships, and and there's a lot more that need to be ready, and they're not ready. So uh, I think I think uh, it is in the best interest for the U.S. to have those ports ready, and in the best interest of of our canal to be ready because. If they're not ready, those goods are not getting there. And, and those ships are not gonna be coming through. I mean, they're gonna go to other ports, but the more, the more ports and the more investment that goes in there, the better for us. Well, and that goes to the point that both of you have been making about the true uh, economic integration between our two economies and how that's building out. It, uh, it, you know, it, it, is, it is incredible how symbiotic 
the, the relationship it is with, with the Panama and the U.S. In, today, 69% of, 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 the, of the goods are either that go through the canal, either go or are either coming or going through the U.S. Yeah. With the expanded canal and, and the LNG exports and all that, that's going to go up to 85%. Yeah. That's what they're projecting. So even more with the expanded canal. So, you know, and, and, and again, you know, LNG exports, 11 days savings yeah. in, in time to market. Huge. 30% cost savings to the East Coast shipping cost. Huge. You know, so, I mean, it, 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 it just, it's tremendous. And, and again, you know, what are the implications? And John said, you know, we really don't know. The canal just opened, just opened last Sunday. So, you know, it, it's, uh, I think it's exciting times. It's an amazingly exciting time. And there are, there are those that we do know, and there are those that we don't know. Maersk last year put through 313 uh, of its ships through the canal. This year it's on track for more than 400. Um, it's already got, uh, in out here, a, uh, a ship that's got 13,000 TEUs, you know, the, the Lego blocks, the containers that come across there. There's a lot that we do know. Um, I would come back to your sort of question, and there's a lot that we don't know about what kind of innovation is going to result from this expanded canal. That's going to really be up to you, quite frankly. That's going to be up to the ingenuity and, and the creativity of the private sectors, uh, not just in the United States, not just in Panama, but around the globe. Um, I would say, though, Eric, if uh, there was one thing I could say to my own people, and in, as a matter of fact, in a week or so, I'm going to be going and doing an American tour, hitting a few cities to do just what Emmanuel and I have, not surprisingly, conspired and talked about, pushing our ports and our cities to be more ready, more uh, 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 sort of in position to accept these changes because, you know, luck favors the prepared mind. So you don't want to just sort of hope that you're lucky and that some innovation comes. You want to be prepared and then sort of like, you know, a good running back in American football or a good middle fielder in soccer, when you see the hole, you see the opportunity, you take it. But my sort of injunction to the American people would be, the Panama really is much, much more than a canal. And that the way in which we, Panama in many ways is a microcosm of the United States. In one way, take a look at the immigration here. Look at the composition. What does it mean to be a Panamanian? It is a country that has been historically, at least over the last hundred years, renewed by waves of different migrants with the good things and some of the bad things about migrants. But if you take a look at the richness of the culture, look at the way in which Panama accepts the world. Uh, this is one of the most open places I have ever been. It is one of the easiest places for Americans to come and to feel at home. You know, I have over 50,000 Americans who are full-time residents, mostly retirees, many on second careers, living in Panama. They've made this place their home because it's that hospitable to Americans and American business. So I would say Panama, it's, you know, the old palindrome, a man, a plan, a Panama Canal. It's much more than a canal. Well, we've gone a little bit beyond time, which is uh, purely the fault of the moderator who has failed. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, uh, now you know why I've, I was looking forward so much to this conversation. Two outstanding representatives of their respective countries work so well together. Uh, fascinating conversation. It's been a real joy for me to join you to run this. And I would simply ask of all of you if you would please join me in thanking both ambassadors for the terrific comments this morning. Thank you.